All right, and welcome back to Saturday Night Chit Chat. And I'm super excited to have this gentleman on. I mean, it would take me probably the whole show to read his resume, play for everybody from George Clinton to Bootsy to Rod Stewart to Mick Jagger, wrote, did some amazing, been involved in amazing music documentaries such as Rumble, the Indians Who Rock the World, uh, that was on PBS. I mean, we'll talk about all that stuff and um, uh, just super excited to have him on today. Please everybody welcome Mr. Stevie Salas. How you doing, Stevie? I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm, how are you? I haven't seen you in a little while. It has been a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I think that, wow, the last time we saw probably was about 10 years ago when I was in LA auditioning for Adam Lambert at American Idol, which is weird to think about. Was that the last time I saw you? You'd have been perfect for that gig. I really wanted to hire you on that gig. Oh, and no, that's all good. <laughs> no, but I remember you came in and played great. And, and the, the guy from American Idol goes, that guy's kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> supposed to be yeah, yeah. That's, that's the thing I, I always think of like i could have been the guy that adam kissed on the american music awards a couple weeks later you never know I, I did that guy and, and 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 then they did that and just you know i'm going to tell you right now that was the first time that i got to music direct the, the american music awards his 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 performance at the american music awards i got to be the music director for the performance oh, and nice. it was complex and we spent a fortune on it and um no one knew he was going to do that. Those two had that plan. Right, and, right. Uh, we the record was going to come out on that, that Tuesday. I think sure. that's when record came out on Tuesday, right? And it was on a Sunday, I think. And we were shipping 1.2 million records for the debut album for Adam Lambert. It's going to be a big record. Right, and right. We did that. Kissed, uh, kissed the bass player, um, and. We jumped on a red eye to New York City. When we got to New York City, we were canceled off every TV show that we were booked to play on. And, oh my um, goodness. We only ended up shipping 400,000 records. So what Adam didn't realize was that even though he was a cutting edge guy, and he was, you know, and it was, he was gay and all his things, you know, whatever that was his world. Right. That wasn't what made, he was famous from being on a family show, which was American Idol. That used to be yeah. mom and Kids sitting down with popcorn and watch American Idol. So right. He wasn't Lady Gaga. He he didn't have that audience that Gaga or Madonna had that would accept that. And right. what they did was all the Midwest people just said, "What?" You know. And, <laughs> right. right. And, you know. So I have a gold album on my wall from Adam, but really I should have a multi platinum. You know? Sure. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and he was just a little bit ahead of his time. You know what I mean? It probably would, if this maybe even happened today, it might have been a little bit different. You know, but it was like it, it was right on that cusp. You know what I mean? Like in terms of 2000, was it 2010, 2011? So it was right on that cusp, you know? Of He was definitely today probably be, be applauded for it. But back then it was like, people were like, I mean, I'm telling you, we went to C CBS or whatever it was. Like, everybody cut us off all the shows. We had to rebook everything. And so we rebooked Letterman and we changed the song. We weren't doing, and that song was gone from, cut, that's entertainment, that song is, history right right went straight into what do you want what do you want from me i think it was called and i told adam when we we're we we're on the set of letterman and i said adam i go none of the other madness stand there and give them what got you here right, right. here yeah, yeah, yeah just sing and he listened to me and he did and it was great and we recovered but we never really recovered but now he's rich as shit because he's a lead singer queen yeah yeah he's so he's doing he's doing fine yeah 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 it's good 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 for him you know and it was you know i mean it was probably like crazy at that time for you all but you know it, sometimes the music industry needs a little shock to the system as i'm sure you know so uh you it, know. it didn't bother me i was still flying first class and getting paid in full so i mean it was, but i was just like you know, it, it's actually kind of cool because now I'm a part of some historic drama. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. And that was a big deal. Yeah, that, that's wild to think about. It was about. a big deal, yeah. It was kind of a big deal for sure. So, you know, uh, I didn't realize when we were texting, uh, setting up the show today that uh, you, how long, you, so you're in Austin, Texas now. How long you've lived there? I didn't even know you moved there. I moved here 10 years ago so my son could go to this really cool school here. And um, oh, nice. I, I really burned out in California and I had you know, my place on the beach in, in, uh, in the Carlsbad, California. And, and I lived on the beach in LA, actually. And then I had I had Halston Hollywood Hills. I was just, you know, out of my mind. And I got rid of everything in California, and moved to Canada. Uh, oh, I right. Work, work in Canada a lot. And sure. I'm actually uh, both Canadian and American now, citizen, the reticent and all that. Oh, nice. And um, 
I, uh, when we were starting, when, it, we were, when my son was going to, was four years old, five years old, was getting ready to start school, his mother was really adamant about a specific school she wanted to go to. So we toured around, you know, the country where these different, where these schools were. And um, I came to Austin to shoot something for the Smithsonian because I was working at the Smithsonian at the time, developing uh, an exhibit there, which would later on become the film Rumble. Yeah. And um, I ran into a ton of my old rock star friends from New York and LA and uh, from my years in the music business in the 90s and in the late 80s that lived in Austin. Yeah. And um, and everything in Austin was super fun and super cheap. And I just said, hey, we're moving to Austin. And we I rolled him into school. We got in the car, drove here. He started school the next day. I bought a house right next to school. And, and that was that. Wow, that's great. I'm, I love it. I can't, I've, came really close a few years back moving there down there myself i mean i, I just love that that's just a magical town as i'm sure you know more, more than i do now living there so. I, I, it's ruined now though so be glad you didn't because yeah if you, you were talking about it would be great because your house would go up 400 percent yeah true total tech net town now and all the super cool musicians I, I left you know the junior brown playing on a sunday yeah. afternoon i know those are no more right. and it's just a bunch of guys with beards and a bunch of guys trying to say an IPA. I can't even get a Corona to save my life. Right, right, right. Yeah. The, um, so, you know, it is what it is. It's got growing pains now. Yeah. But I t the funny. Okay, so I went to a lunch meeting. I got asked to speak at Notre Dame University for my film Rumble. And I was like, mm, you know, cause it's, it's a history film and I'm going to speak speaking at university. Sure, so sure. He minus in history class, right, by the way, in high school. And... Um, I sit down at a lunch and the guy goes, we have a mutual friend in Freak Base. And I'm like, excuse me? Ted, and, right? Yeah, and, and I go, I'm like, what? I'm at Notre Dame, right? And he goes, oh yeah, he comes here and a girl came in and she goes, we run the video department and he comes and makes all those music videos here and all kinds yeah. of stuff. I go tell him, I said, hi, that's so awesome. And, and they might have sent me the videos that they made of you at the time so I could watch them. And right. Stuff. That is wild, man. This is such a freaking small world, man. Unbelievable. That's awesome. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? I mean, that... you know, I don't mean any disrespect to anyone, but when I'm sitting at Notre Dame University, the last person I get, you know, they're, they're going to bring down, they're going to, you know, hey, we got to be sure freak base. I'm like, yeah, right, right. They're going to say like somebody, you know, from the Smithsonian I met or some crazy weird thing or something like, you know whatever and i thought that was super cool man i was like freak base oh my god that that's is awesome. So awesome well hey man you know for years and years stevie like you know you know obviously i worked a lot with bootsy you've worked a lot with bootsy and george clinton i mean you know, i heard your your name from bootsy for just so so long before we actually met and um like how did you you know I, i'm assuming you met george first and then bootsy afterwards or how did that that connection i've always wondered how you guys initially connected you know, it, it's kind of a joke, really, because um, what happened was I moved it. I left San Diego. I had my San Diego band. I got out of high school and I realized that band wasn't going to make it. Um, we were really popular, but I just knew it yeah. needed another level. So I packed up my bags on July, January 1st, 1985. So I San Diego, my, not to interrupt you, San Diego is where you kind of grew up then, right? In Perdona? San Diego. Okay, I, got I, it. San Diego lived on the beach in San Diego. Got it. And, um, in a place called Oceanside, California at the time. So I yeah. packed up my, my stuff in my in my parents' house. So I lived with my mom and dad. And I moved to LA, I moved to Hollywood. Yeah. And I lived in a closet for a while and I started a band with the drummer, Winston A. Watson Jr., who became the color code drummer and later was Bob Dylan's drummer for many years. Nice. Um, we were living together and I lived in a walk-in closet. But, and we lived at this, this girl had a rich dad who worked for 20th Century Fox and she was kind of a junkie. And uh, she lit the house on fire and there was some problems and we all had to move out August of 85. Um, I didn't want to move home, so I, I, I was friends with some guys at a studio called Baby O Recording Studios in Hollywood, where I used to hang out, and they let me um, sleep. And I put all my clothes in garbage bags, and they let me sleep in the studio couch. And for return, I would sweep up and clean up, and I ran their, helped run their rehearsal space that they had purchased, right? And it was the most horrible summer of my life. It was like August, hot, smoggy in Hollywood. I got, you know, I'm used to beach and surfing. And sure, yeah. But every time a musician would walk into Baby O Studios, I'd say, my name's Stevie Solis, I play guitar. Yeah. You know, and like Gene Simmons and people like that were like, get out of my way, whatever, fuck off. So was it like an SIR kind of situation, one of those? No, 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 no. Baby O Recording Studio was a state-of-the-art uh, recording studio. Like it was in, Gene Simmons was in there producing a band. And, oh, and nice, cool. Vincent and Bajan, or all these, all these bands were coming through. It was 1985, right? Yeah. So it was a rock and roll thing going on. Right, right. And, uh, 
I met Matt Sorm there. He was oh, unknown. Okay. Working with a guy, and he became my friend, and he was a starving musician too at the time. And so yeah. it was a really good place because in the studios in the in the eighties, is you if you could hang out with them and at certain clubs at night, you'd meet everybody if right. you were there the right nights and the right places. And that's kind of right. how the work was relationships big time. And so what happened was George Clinton came in one night, and I had been working with this Fairlight programmer uh, guy named Zio, who was this intense guy, and he was one of the few guys with a Fairlight in nineteen eighty five, and and George knew him. And so when George came up, I used Zio's name to break the ice. And I said, I play guitar. And he was there with David Spradley. You know, they did Atomic Dog together. Yeah, yeah. And and George didn't tell me to fuck off. George just said, okay, cool. That was it. So uh, that night, I, you know, one in the morning or some two in the morning, I'm sleeping. And, and, and uh, about three in the morning, two or three in the morning, David Spradley comes into the room I'm sleeping in. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like hey, hey, so I don't get it, you know. You think you might want to come down and try some guitar on this track? And I'm like, yeah! Wow. Yeah. And so um, just like that, I went down there and they had a guy called Jack Sherman. You know, rest in peace, Jack just died this year. But Jack was then the guitar player for the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Okay. And um, he was in there playing for a long time. And uh, so it was a little uncomfortable because then they wanted me to come in and play. And he right. was still. So he was like, why don't we play together? And they were like, I think they wanted him to leave and me to play. Right. But he said, this will be cool. Let's jam together. And so they said, sure. Keep the vibe okay. Right. 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 Really comfortable, kind of. Yeah. It was jam session. All of a sudden, I'm stepping on his toes. Sure. Right? Sure. Right, right. But I didn't give a shit because I'm like, I'm here to, I'm here to make it. Right. It's right. Like, it. Now right. I'd probably be a respect. Like, nah, I don't want to do this. Anymore. Right. 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 Then, Fuck you. I'm, right. I'm here. Right. And Jack was playing this amazing shit. I was listening to what they were working on. And I thought to myself, man, what he's playing is, like a, he was playing this funk riff thing. It was like, it was just really bitching, man. And, but I realized something that day, and it was a lesson I learned on my very, this was my very first professional recording session that I got paid for. And I learned something that day. I realized that what Jack was doing was giving those guys something that they've heard a million times because he grew up listening to Funkadelic and Bootsy. Right, right. And so he he had perfected Boogie's kind of guitar sounds or Scheider's right. kind of guitar parts, right? Of even what right. Bootsy would play. Yeah. And he was giving it to him for real. Yeah. Right. But that's not what they they did. They'd already got that. Right. Right. So right, I thought, right. I'm gonna go bonkers here. And I and George plugged me into all these marshals that the band Keel was there, Mark Ferrari, who's my dear friend now, but he was in the band and he was actually nice to me then when I was homeless. Uh, they had all these amps with yellow tapes saying, do not touch. And George Clinton goes, come on, fuck this. He plugged these marshals and all this shit. Just cranked it. And I just started doing like, you know, I was really into Steve Stevens at the time. I loved that Billy Idol Rebel Yell album. Yeah. And I had a wang bar with a, you know, not a Floyd Rose because I had a cheap Ibanez one with a pop metal, fucking, you know, $200 guitar. But yeah. I was like, Ow! and I was doing all this shit. And George was like, whoa, what the fuck's going He came running in the room, I remember. And um, he said, what the hell's going on in here? It sounds like a crazy freight train or some shit, right? And he comes next to me and they roll the tape and Jack Sherman's on one side, but George is next to me. And and we start playing. And you know, I don't know if you, you probably remember this, but back then when you would do a funk song, it was one whole roll of tape was one song. You would roll a groove or a loop for 15 minutes, because that was one roll of two inch tape at 30 yeah. inches, 15 minutes. And the song was just like, it would go forever, right? And right, would right. Come back, and they would lay on it forever with all these ideas on it, right? Yeah. And so I remember just fucking playing, and my veins were like bulging. Nine minutes in, and my fucking veins are bulging. Like, <laughs> and George is next to me. He's, he's swinging those. He had colored braids back then, and he's hitting me in the face. That hit me. Like, play some yeah. rock. Play some blues. Okay, get fucking out. And it was breathing, and he's. Dunk. I mean, I remember he bo, yeah, bo, and his fucking hair was slapping me, and 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 that and then braids hurt when they slap you. By the way, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It hair, right? It was some kind of synthetic shit. And I remember it's hitting me, it fucking stinking, and I was just jamming. And at the end of the night, Jack Sherman left, and I was invited to stay. And and now I lived at the studio, and every day I was hanging out with George and Gary Scheider would be like, I remember Gary Scheider would like. He'd lean against the wall and he always had like this, like a sailor's hat, like he was a, like a captain or some shit. Yeah, right? it wasn't yeah, yeah. A sailor round hat, like he was a, like a, like a private. He was like, like he was a skipper. Right. Was like right. A skipper. 
right, and he right, went right. sideways and, and he'd lean on this shit with like a gangster lean and he had that big old smile he, he had this smile it looked like a cheshire cat yeah and, stood, and shider would talk to me about shit he's talking so you know, tell me about yourself blah 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 and he, and he was, it was bitching he would talk to me all the time it was so nice to me and and then and then one day bootsy showed up and the whole place was bonkers yeah sure bootsy's here bootsy's coming bootsy's here I'm like, wow, Bootsy Collins is coming in, you know? Because I knew George and Bootsy Collins from my, when I was in high school. I was on the wrestling team. And 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 all the brothers on the team would be like, we'd be in a car, the bus going to a match, and they'd be like, listen to this shit. This is, this, like, they knew I liked Kiss, right? Right. So they're this is like the Kiss of black music. It's Funkadelic, George Clinton Parliament. And I remember, they played me that shit. So all of a sudden, I, I knew Bootsy, I knew George, and there I am with George and Bootsy. I wanted to call, you know, my buddies from the wrestling, from my El Camino High School wrestling team say, hey man, yeah. remember that I'm actually with them right now. Yeah. And uh, Bootsy, Bootsy saw me and he just instantly came to me and like took me right into his thing. And and he, he kept me close because he was looking for new things. And to him, it felt like I was providing something new. Right. He, yeah. And, um, and he started to sit with me about talk about songwriting and programming a Lindrum and he had yeah, some drum. that's what he did with me too, man. It's like when we met, it was like you know, of course, me being a bass player, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna learn all this cool bass stuff. You know what I mean? And yeah, you know, we, there was a little bit of that, but it was mostly about writing songs and working in a studio and how to the MPC 2000 and you know and like yeah. produ production and stuff. You know, it was like a mentor thing. It was that same vibe, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. He was yeah. really that. We yeah. never actually ever touched the bass, hardly ever. Yeah, that's yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Matter of fact, most I ever saw him play the bass really was when we did the hardware album with me, him, and Buddy Miles, and we made like a rock trio. Right, and, right. And he was set up with the three amps. We yeah. were all in the same room, and he had the he had the space bass, and I used to grab that space bass man, weighed like five thousand pounds. Right, people. right, right. And. Um, that was the most I ever saw him because usually when he would do that shit, it was like he'd kick everyone out and he would just sit there for a minute. But right. most of he was working on song and playing the guitar and stuff. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so so he took me under his wing and I worked there for the whole month with him and George. And like George, one of the songs we did was in the Iron Eagles soundtrack and we got invited to go to the thing. Uh, to the premiere, and George invited me to come with him, and I get to go in the limousine with George, right? Um, and I remember we come, and, we, and when the song came on, it was on for like ten seconds, and you could barely hear it in the back. Some people were talking, and uh, we were like, "That's it!" So then, me and George, and whoever was with us, maybe it was uh, maybe it was Aunt Fiddler and a couple guys, we all yeah. got it. We tiptoed out, all embarrassed, and snuck out back in the limo, and went back to the studio. And uh, so, you know, I was getting to live it. And, and what happened was, everybody was thinking I was George Clinton's guitar player from Detroit. So Mug started calling up and coming in and saying hi to me and want my number. I'll call him Bernadette from Climax. Can you come in and do a session? I'd be like, yeah, I'm double scale. And she goes, that's no problem, man. You know, I was George Clinton's guitar player. I never did shit. I never did nothing. Right. And so I'm telling Mugs I was double scale and they were paying me double scale. Wow. And, yeah, man. It was just like one of them things where I, I rolled the dice and George and Bootsy gave me a... a they validated who I was. So yeah. People didn't question if I had skills or not. Right. Even I, I really didn't have that much skills. I don't think. Yeah. I had a unique sort of an energy. Yeah. That worked with what I did. That came across on the record somehow. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't like I was like most would go like I didn't even know what a pentatonic scale was or nothing. Sure. So you know who knows. So, so that was it. And George and Bootsy then once they embraced me, I had a. A nucleus to where everywhere I went I had credibility right right yeah yeah definitely Def and then as you you know obviously went on you you know ended up just from word of mouth you know just from doing those sessions and doing other gigs I'm assuming that's kind of how that parlayed into some of the other people like ie like the Mick Jaggers and the Rod Stewart's I was like kind of in the just working in the same scene and getting your name around like in a nutshell I guess Almost, almost. What happened was a couple of weird things. That it wasn't just that, because like Rod, Rod, I'll tell you, it, it led into this, but more, it was more about the, the opportunity that George and Bootsy and and and, and uh, Funkadelic guys gave me 
led more doors to open, which led to me getting a buzz in Los Angeles. I became the guy in Los Angeles, like Jamie Cohn from Columbia Records, and people like that let me pal around with them because they thought I was cool. Right. And, and they thought, oh, there's something there. Maybe this guy's going to get a record deal. Um, and that growth is what made Rod Stewart call me. But it, there's a short story, though, that what, one day Bootsy and I were in the studio, and he goes, oh, you know, come on, we got to go to Columbia today to a meeting, and we're going to play him some of these four-track demos you've been playing. We're going to meet some guy called Don Woods. And I'm like, okay. Ah. I don't know. We're going to Columbia Records. Was, for me, that was badass. Sure, right, right, right. Yeah. And... Um, Ironically, Jamie Cohen was a guy who was interested in my high school band, This Kids. So when he was at EMI. So I actually knew him, which broke the ice and was weird. You know what I mean? It was really yeah. like everything was falling into place. So Don Was comes, and I never heard of Don Was. I didn't know who he was. I, I, we all thought he was from England. Oh, yeah. He was a big producer in England. Yeah. And they, they were, we were meeting Don about Don producing some of the What's Gucci Do It album. And um, Don heard my four track demos and then called me later that day and said, hey, I'm making an album. You want to want to come play on it? I'm like, yeah, I do. I'm, I, you know, I'm fucking broke and I, this would be sure. cool. So I went to the studio. He had a studio I set up at his house up in the, up in the hills, just on the other side of Laurel Canyon. And um, I started hanging with Don. And uh, we made this album called What Up Dog. And and then we were going to shoot a video for a song called Spying the House. No, the first one was Walk the Dinosaur or Spine House 11, I can't remember. And next thing you know, Walk the Dinosaur was the number one record in England. And now Don says, we need a band. So I put together a band with my friends, with Amp Fiddler, uh -huh. Carla who was playing drums with Wendy and Lisa. She played percussion, Winston's in the band. And, and we started going to England. And it's just fucking, shit was crazy. And next thing you know, we have a number one record. It was not was. At the same time, a guy, a huge producer named David Kirschenbaum, um, had a studio called Power Tracks, and he was he was a music supervisor for huge films, and he needed someone who knew something about what they called rap music then. It wasn't called hip hop then; it was called rap. Yeah, right, right. And I go, I know a little about rap music because I play with George Clinton and, and and my friend David Friendly had showed me how to sample with. Uh, you could sample for a second back then, so you did a sample like a cassette of ACDC, like right. you hit the opening hit of Back in Black. Bam, 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 bam. Right. Right, you know, right. It was, man, a cat would rap over it, right? It was yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so he, I went and met David Christian one when he goes, okay, I gotta, I'm got i doing a soundtrack for a film called Big Shots, or was it Action Jackson? It was one of those two, but I did two, both of them. Yeah. And he did some rap music in it, and I knew these two kids, and these two kids called the West Coast Posse, and I and I cut this track, and next thing you know, Atlantic and Lorimar is putting it out as a 12-inch. So everyone thought I was an expert on, on rap. <laughs> right? wow. And so I kept doing that and 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 that was cool. And, and then through him, David calls me one day and he says, hey, um, we're working on a movie called Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. I need you to, to score it because there's a score there, but it's not, has nothing to do with rock and roll. It's a movie right. about two kids love rock and roll. So I took the original score and I, and I re-scored over the score, which was really weird, right? It was oh, like, wow. I added, I played guitar. I, like, I added all the stuff too when they didn't know how to play in the garage. I don't know if you ever saw the film. But I did all this, scored over it. Bill and Ted, no big deal. Uh, and then one day he calls me and goes, oh, the ending of the film's not testing well. They want to do some weird things. So I showed up on, on, at a house and we had the whole setup there and Keanu Reeves was there and I was there. And George Carlin was there. And I shared, mm -hmm. shared a, a, a trailer with George Carlin, which was one of the most amazing nights. Wow, wow. And, and, and I shot that scene at the end of Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure where I play this crazy solo, and the guys are like, wow, who's this you play? And he goes, well, just a little, you know, and they shot me from here down, and they shot George Carlin from here up. But if wow. you look, the hands are brown, because I'm American yeah. Indian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. George's face is super white, right? Yeah. And now if you see the film, you'll go, how did I never notice that? No, I right. that, that comes out and becomes a billion dollar film. Just, yeah. just was not was as number one. Uh, everything that's going on is just exploding around me. Bootsy, I did Bootsy, what's Bootsy doing album? I'm known because I did George Clinton. And and I, I got a buzz in the city, and that's how I got the Rod Stewart gig, really. Andy Taylor first hired me. He quit Duran Duran and hired me, and then he fired me, which was devastating to me. So we were going on tour opening for the Psychedelic first. And the first gig was the LA Forum, and my dream was to play sports arenas. Sure. But, because, but he had the same manager as Rod. Rod Rod and then brought me in, and Rod said, fuck, fuck Andy, man, you're playing with me. And Rod Stewart was a private plane, and 
you know, five nights at the LA Forum sold out. You know, it was like, so it was, oh, and firing me was the greatest thing. It was, seemed like at the time the worst thing in my life that ever happened. I was so embarrassed. Um, but it became, it was really the best thing that ever happened. So, yeah. so here, here's a lesson for your free base. I was homeless, the worst thing in my life, but I meet George Clinton and changed the world. Okay, Andy Taylor fires me. All my friends in high school had already bought tickets for the San Diego show. I had to tell everybody I'm not gonna be playing, guys. It's so embarrassing. Just the best thing that ever happened to me. So sometimes, all you people out there, some bad things are meant to happen and you need to write them out and see why they happen because it turns into something else. Yeah, that's a great, great lesson. That's incredible. Wow. And then was uh, with Mick, did you, was that after? post Rod Stewart and I'm sure that kind of segued off of that is kind of thing. Mick was way past Rod Stewart. People don't realize I had played with Rod Stewart in 1988-89 and at the same time I was playing with Rod Stewart I got a gigantic recording contract with Island Records and I didn't want to tell Rod so I kept it a secret and at, in 1989 uh, we were getting ready to go do a bunch of stadiums in South America, which I really wanted to do. But the record company said to me, look, you need to decide, do you want to be your own artist or do you want to be his guitar player? Right. And I didn't want to quit Rod Stewart because everyone in the band, Carmine Rojas on bass and Bowie and all these sure guys. Are, yeah. I had Carmine Rojas' poster on my on the wall in my mom and dad's bedroom where I live, my bedroom and my mom and dad's house. Right, I mean, right. And with him, right? And I'm, it was Tony Thompson at first, then it became Tony Brock. And, Jeff Golub, the greatest guitar player, taught me so much. I didn't want to leave. They were like my big brothers. I was like a little kid in the band, right? Yeah, and, they were, yeah. and and I was having the time of my life. Oh my God, everywhere we went, it was just all the wrong things. Tons of money, tons of fun, tons of drinking and drugs and, and, and Playboy centerfolds and supermodels and all the things you think you want as a kid. Right. It were pretty fun. I enjoyed it. Yeah. So I have no regrets. Right, Never. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh but I, so I didn't want to leave, but I had to become responsible and leave. And what happened was then I really focused on Stevie Solis' color code. And for 10 years straight, I was doing an album, a world tour, and then I'd stop and maybe I'd go out and be Terrence Strait Darby's music director and go on tour with Duran Duran. Or, right. I, because I felt like, and you could probably identify with this, every time I went out with some amazing, somebody like Terrence Strait Darby, who's now Sonanda Matreya, um, you learn so much you pick up so much sure, yeah. what's around you and then you go back in the studio for your own new writing and you got these ideas it's like a brilliant and i'm talking about brilliant guys yeah Terrence Trent Darby was a genius of an artist and, a, and an amazing singer rod stewart was an amazing singer yeah. you know you surround yourself bootsy collins is a genius you know george clinton is a genius so you surround yourself with <clears> these people absorb absorb it so anytime I had an opportunity to go work with somebody amazing, I always said yes. You know, so yeah. that's why I was afraid to do the album with Buddy Miles and Bootsy Collins with Bill Laswell, which George is on and Bernie Wells is on. And, yeah. But Bootsy said, you're crazy if you don't do it. And I did it and I learned so much, right? Yeah. So what happened was I did 10 years of that, you know, and did well around the world, but bombed in America. I just couldn't sell a record in America, which was crushing to me mentally. Mentally, it meant really was messing with me. And I was quite financially secure because I had this gigantic contract, my own label, and I was getting all the money. And so I had tons of money, but I, I was just so unhappy because I was a failure in America. And um, I decided to retire. In 1999, I was one of the headliners and co-headliners of the Fuji Rock Fest. And it was going to be my last gig ever. And I'm, And that was it. I was done, and and then what happened was, I my my girlfriend at the time um, committed suicide, which was just awful. We had broken up, and she committed suicide, and mm. and I was in the worst possible place I could be. I didn't care if I lived and died. I mean, it's not sound dramatic, but I didn't give a shit. I was I had you know two beach houses and a boat and all the bullshit, motorcycles and cars. And none of it mattered, and I was I was leaving to Africa. For months and not talking to anybody and just sitting on the beach drinking till I fucking passed out in the sand or whatever. You know, I was just out of my mind and, and I wasn't playing my guitar at all. Yeah. Um, I didn't want to make another record. I didn't want to be in the music business. And like, I get a call and it's Mick Jagger. It was like God intercepted me. Wow. Who's going to get me out of a hole? Mick Jagger calls. <laughs> like crawl out of my fucking hole and wash my face and I go play with and, and Mick 
brought me back to life. Wow. Mick, Mick was like, it was just like 2002 or three or something like that. 2001, yeah. 2002, 2001, I can't remember. Yeah. And Mick, Mick would just call every day, like, Stevie, what about this? It, he was every detail. You know how we, we fuss and Bootsy fusses over detail? Yeah, yeah. He would fuss over every detail, Stevie. I would really think, what about it? You know, and this is a guy who's the most, he's the biggest rock star in the history of rock and roll. And right. He doesn't give a shit, but he gave a shit about every little thing. Yeah. And he came every day to rehearsal with so much energy. And it just brought me back to life. It was like a gift from God. Yeah. And I did gag. And after that, I started to, to come back to life. And then, I, and, then I, then I, and then the music business was imploding. Right, 2003, right. four, it was imploding. Um, I went to Canada, opened up for the Rolling Stones, and I met a guy, a Native American Imploding guy. because of the whole Napster thing? Yeah. MP3 Napster, thing? Yeah, yeah. Digital, nobody knows what's going on. Right. No right. one contracts. It was like, unless you're a pop kid, right? It was right. just like, right. it was over. I thought it was over. For me, it wasn't exciting anymore. Because when I was young, you know, I would go, I remember going to A&M Records, and, and Carter was an A&R writer, and he said, uh, you, you got a good look, you know, you're interesting. Uh, this stuff you're working on is pretty interesting. Here's ten thousand dollars. Why don't right. you come back a month and come up with some ideas? And, yeah. And then yeah, yeah. hey, this is this is shit and this is shit, but this thing right here is pretty cool. Why don't you focus in this direction? You make a call. Um, I want you to go to England. <laughs> There's a guy here that you should try working with. Yeah. And here's a grand. <laughs> and yeah. you know, they developed you and they developed and then at right. the end he goes, oh, you know, we're not gonna sign yet. But then those demos got heard by uh, Mitchell Kraus now at Electra, right. and he's this is cool, and and right. so there was development. And my point is, there was artist development then. They developed you, like they would see you, and right. say this badass freak face, and he'd be perfect. And Adam Lambert's man, that's what I did. I thought right. oh, I, I want this guy. I think this guy would be a really cool thing on television with Adam Lambert. And he'd yeah, play. you know cause that's how it works, right? Right. And so. There was no more of that in the two, early 2000s. It was, yeah. it, can you get on KROQ on your own? If you can, we can sign you. You know, it was like really bad. All the NR guys were like dummies and young guys, and they, they didn't know their head from their ass. And everybody just it was fake punk rockers everywhere. And there's yeah, yeah, there like, wasn't wasn't really anything interesting going on. Yeah. So um, about that time, I belonged to a group. I joined up a group of uh, private clubs, so to speak, of giant music executives. I was the only musician. It was all managers, lawyers, heads of A&R, presidents of record labels, uh, head of William Morris, you know, music department, John Marks, and guys like that. And we, we would travel around the world and surf. And all we would do is surf and drink, and they'd smoke cigars, I didn't smoke cigars. And we'd, you know, hang out and have fun and surf. And we called it, a, you know, it was business. But it was business because every time I needed it, if I needed my an agent, I'd go to John Marks and uh, William Morris. And if I needed, uh, you know, Sterling, you needed something, you'd call me. So Sterling McElwain, who was a manager, said, "Hey, I just got an offer to go to American Idol." And he goes, "I need your help if I do this." And I go, "Good, okay." So he went and he hired. And he goes, "The first kid he had to work with was a guy called Daughtry." And he goes, "I need you to help me with Daughtry as a music director." And so I was already a music director for Jagger and all. Sure, yeah, yeah. And so I became a consultant at American Idol, and at the time. It was the coolest thing in the world. It was the biggest thing in the world going. And I had I had to no longer worry about my credibility being shot. Like if I would have done American Idol in 2000, and I don't think Mick Jagger would have wanted me as, as his music director. Right, was, right, right. Because it was uncool then. Right, But by right. 2006, it was cool. Right. And it was the biggest shit in town. And all of a sudden, I'm like, I can talk to Clive Davis again. And I can, you know, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm in a big game again. It's a big game. 30 million viewers a night. Yeah. And so I took on Idol and I took, I did Idol for, for four seasons. I mean, I had a lot of success, like 5 million records with Daughtry, 2 million with Jordan Sparks, a million with David Cook, um, a million with Chris, uh, Chris Allen, and a half a million with, uh, with, um, Adam. Yeah. Lambert. Yeah. Yeah. And then, I, and then that was getting stale to me and I fucked off. Yeah. And that, I was done with that. And that's really when I started getting into film production and television production. And, and those type of things. Wow, that's amazing. Well, let me, let's zap ahead a little bit, Stevie, and uh, we'll kind of get kind of close to wrapping up. But I wanted to ask you, um, and you are somebody I would love to hear your opinion probably more than I ask this question to every single guest on the show, and, and no one's a genie and no one's a wizard, so we, no one knows for sure. But 
what's your general feel like especially with live music say like fall of 20 you know like this coming fall you know whatever five six months away from now i mean where do you think we're going to be at and i know some of the outside festival stuff i can kind of wrap my head around that but more like club type touring type stuff you know whether it be bigger clubs or you know mid-size i mean what do you what do you think we're at on that are we still a ways away a couple years are we still are we, are we getting close what do you think I think at the end of the day, the thing I've learned about traveling around the world like I do, money rules all. Money is the new God. And I'll be goddamn if they're going to be able to hold this thing down much longer because people want to spend money and people want to make money. And so I think that right now, like, for instance, I'm going to tell you, you know, anything can happen because in 2017, I got a call from a guy called Koshi Naba, who's been a friend of mine for years. He's the biggest selling rock star in the history of rock and roll. Okay? Yeah. I mean, the history of Japan. I'm sorry. 100 million records. And he asked me, can you want to write some songs? I'm really brain dead. I got no, no inspiration. I flew to Japan, write a few songs. It turns out cool. I put a get band together. I get Stuart Zender from Jamiroquai on bass. Yeah. And, 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 and uh, Matt Sherrod from, at the time he was playing with Beck and with Crowded House. Yeah. And and we go over there. We have a number one record, number two record, that record. And and, and playing funk, like old school, eight, late 80s funk. Pretty yeah, much. yeah, 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 yeah. With, with Koshi singing. And I sell, I get a gold album again. And it was like, and we're playing arenas. So I did a second album called Maximo Huevo, right? And we finished it right when the pandemic hit. But it was number one on Billboard. I was on the cover of Rolling Stone for the first time in my life. So my point of all this is like, you never know what's going to happen. And you and you, and you don't have to be a kid anymore to be successful. Sure. Right? Yeah. I'm on the cover of Rolling Stone for the first time in my whole 25 year career or whatever it is, right? Yeah. And, and the pandemic hits and we cancel, we cancel we have to give back the money for 90,000 pre-sold tickets. And um, I know for a fact that everyone's chomping to reschedule and we are gonna reschedule. I think that 2020, right now in Japan, they're doing half full venues, which yeah. you can't make any money. I mean, who wants to play a 20,000 seater with 10,000 people in it? Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Or a 5,000 seater with 2,000 people in it. Right, whatever. right, right. So it's a matter of time before everyone's going to be fed up. People want to see shows and people want to make money. So I believe that it won't be 2021. I think 2021 people are dabbing their toe in it. Yeah. But by 2022, I think everything's going to be back to normal. Hell, you know, be sick or not. Um, right. You know, I I think that uh, I think that all everyone will be working again in 2022. That's yeah. my prediction, my bold prediction. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Well, that's good. That's good to hear. And you, you would know. And I, that's kind of the general consensus I'm hearing pretty much across the board from most people. They're, you know, doesn't matter what style of music they do or whatever. I'm hearing that that 2022. I mean, obviously, there'll be some little sporadic things probably in 2021, you know. Uh, I mean, I wonder, like, the one, the, the big one I'm wondering about, the, the kind of the big ones, you know, they're, gonna, they're, they're supposed to be doing Jazz Fest down in New Orleans in, uh, was that, October, I think? And as far as I know, it's full capacity. So, you know, it's going to be because that, that's a ton of freaking people. You know what I mean? And so that's going to be interesting to see. You know, that's going to be a good gauge, at least for this year, you know. Let's face it. We're just pawns in a bullshit game. Because like I was in Mexico last week. I went to Cabo San Lucas. Hung out with my boy, Sammy, Sammy Hagel. I went more on fishing. And, nice. and you know, they, so the airplanes are like, you know, part of the corporate structure. The corporations are running our planet now. I mean, they yeah. control Okay, so you know, you get on the plane, they sell out every seat, you're sitting like this next to each other, you're in line getting in line with everybody like this, you know. There's no six feet of separation when you're trying to wait to get in your seat. Right. But yeah, okay, we're following respect of corporate guy of uh COVID guidelines, so we're not giving you any food or any drinks. Right. right? Because right, right. Be busy in the hall. <laughs> Whatever and we're all sitting on top of each other. The whole thing's bullshit. The whole yeah. thing is bullshit. Then they charge you another, you know, they want to charge me two hundred bucks to get my even though I have the vaccine, they want to charge me 200 bucks. I have to have a COVID test. They want to be on a plane. I go, wait, yeah. I got that. It, the whole thing's a money grab and people are making a fortune. But sooner or later, I think that people are, are getting fed up. And the politicians are such idiots and they're just playing us back and forth. And we're just like, they're like a pinball. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I think that people are starting to get fed up with it. And I think that everyone's going to say like, I myself would risk getting the flu or risk getting COVID. And I mean, no disrespect to anybody who's been sick or anybody who's afraid of the disease, but that's my choice. I would do it. Um, I also wear a mask out of respect for my, my people around me. So sure. they're not going to Yeah. But I myself, as a person, I'm not afraid of getting the disease. As a matter of fact, I think I got it at the NAMM show in 2020. Right, right. See, I heard a lot of people. Yeah, I've heard that from a lot of people that were there. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, 
I don't know. I think that it's just a matter of time before people are going to be like, I I'm no longer just going to sit in the house anymore. I got to get out. Right, right, right. I got and you. what's going to bring it out is the promoters. That you know, Clear Channel, all these, uh, Clear, you know, Live Nation. These guys yep. are these guys are billion billion dollar conglomerates. Right. And they're not going to let that. They're not going to let that go down. Money is going to trump. They'll feed more money to politicians to pass more opening door things up. Right. And, Politicians are just puppets trying to make money, trying to get rich. They don't give a shit about us. Yeah. So yeah. I think I think it's going to all open up. Yeah. All right. Well, cool to hear. Well, man, Steve, I can't thank you so much for taking some of your time today. I mean, I'm always keeping an eye on you. You're always such a freaking inspiration. You know, we have that oh. that we have that funk connection. You know, we always. I mean, it's like it seems like not a couple months go by where I don't hear your name in the, in the circle, you know, whether it be from Bootsy or Patty or, you know, whatever, you know, the type thing. So I can't wait to tell Bootsy that I talked to you today, which I'm sure he'll be super excited about. And Give him a hug. Uh, of course I will. Definitely, man. And uh, I hope to next time we see each other, we'll be in person. Yeah. Hopefully playing together or something. Also. Hey, but real quick, tell your friends to check out my film rumble. Uh, it's it's for free now on Amazon prime. I got, I lost the Emmy award. So I'm an official Emmy loser. Oh, uh, um, but the film is, is about the Native American influence on pop music history and, and George Clinton's in it. Everyone's in that you know is in the film. And uh, so check that out. In the film Dude, Rumble. I'm gonna watch I'll watch that tonight, man. I'm a streaming streaming junkie, so I'll watch that tonight. And so it's Amazon Amazon Prime, it's on there? Amazon Prime, yeah. It's a documentary called Rumble the Indians that Rock the World. Awesome. So All about the one Sundance won three Canadian Academy Awards and it, and it was nominated for an Emmy, which I lost. So that, on my Instagram, you'll see it says Emmy loser. <laughs> okay. All right. Great. Great. All right. Maybe I should put almost kissed Adam Lambert on mine for, for, my, for mine. Have, could have been the man that kissed him. That's right. That's right. All right. Cool. Well, man, you take care of yourself. Good. You know, say, uh, hope everything's good with your family and, and enjoy Austin. And uh, I'll see you next time, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care.